I wanted to show a, a couple flat earth models because they're here all the time. You know, where's your model? So here's um, a shout out to um, Dr. Zach, Mike Cavanaugh, and Steve Torrance. If you want to see more on this model, um, it's in the YouTube channel, Steve. And uh, this is a teeny little piece of it. It's literally terabytes of information on all the planets, the moon, the sun. It's like based on a magnetic like torus field or a focal point of energy the sun that is and they added atmosphere and everything fell right into place but um it, this i show a little tiny clip of the sun um in front of clouds uh thick clouds that where i'm from block out the sun i think that proves it's a focal point of energy or maybe a focal point of light of some sort but i, I wanted to show these uh, I wanted to show this. If you're interested in a flat Earth model, this one's thorough. So the atmosphere is something that we can't ignore. It's like looking at the sun with your glasses on. The atmosphere. Now, in order to prove this, we had to add the atmosphere to Steve's model. With 3D software, you can model the atmosphere very accurately using refraction settings. We're not talking about drawing it and making it visible. We're talking about drawing the layers with their real effects on sunlight. Once I discovered it, I told my team. Guys, we've got a solution. We can test the atmosphere's effect on the light. Modern science claims that the apparent sun sets after the real sun because of the atmosphere and the effect of refraction. So when we see the apparent sun above the horizon line, that is just a reflection of the real sun which is already set. But when we added the atmosphere to the globe model, it did the same thing that it did on the flat earth model. The apparent sun goes down first and the real sun follows it. That is contrary to the way refraction is normally presented. So Many scientists think that the flat earth model can't work because it can't represent sunrise and sunset. What are they going to say after studying this proof? They can't ignore the atmosphere. And all we did to make the flat earth model work was add the atmosphere exactly how science represents it. We didn't make it up. When the sun is directly overhead, the refraction is near zero, but you still can't say where the sun actually is. As the sun travels towards the west, the atmosphere creates an image of it for every eye. So anyone who looks at the sun from the same angle as you, but from a different city, will see the apparent sun in a different position. But no one can see the sun in its real position. So if you try to triangulate the sun, you will never get the exact distance. This is like trying to triangulate a rainbow. Here's a glimpse of another functioning flat earth model. If you want to see it in depth, go to truelon.com. I believe he put this one together for celestial navigation and it works and it is based on the refraction of light due to the atmosphere so give it a look see it's about a half moon and so you would think if the moon is reflecting the light of the sun then the source of the light that would cast that type of shadow should be direct directly across from it somewhere up here in this direction right directly parallel to uh the light source should be right across from it right but it's not the sun's way down here so how is the sun way down here getting that angle of a shadow on the moon? Why isn't it doing the same thing to the moon that it's doing to me? And now it's about uh, 5.45 p.m. or so, about an hour later from the last video that I shot. See the moon going, I mean, see the sun going down in the west over there. And go this way and up, and there's the moon with the shadow angled this way. So you would think that if the moon is reflecting the light of the sun, that the sun should be shining this way. The problem is the sun is now way down here. So if you raise up the moon half a degree, you would raise it up 2,000 miles, which is not, I mean, it, it kind of would help. But the, the sun, if you raise it up half a degree, you'd raise it up 800,000 miles. So he was right. I checked the math, and if you draw a straight line from your feet off into space, 93 million miles, at half a degree, that puts the sun at 800,000 miles high. So a sun at one degree, just barely above the horizon, puts it 1,600,000 miles above your feet. So, okay, this is how they explain the downward light cast from the sun on the moon. So let's apply that principle to other globe proofs. I got to thinking about it and so look at this photo the sun's sitting on the horizon but look at the diverging shadows that proves the local sun right there on its face but how can you have a sun sitting on the horizon look well above the horizon 
that's supposed to be a million six hundred thousand miles above your feet shine up on the bottom of clouds and cast shadows of mountains up on clouds you can't have both you can't have a, a sun that high shining downward on the moon and putting a shadow on the ground but also putting a shadow up on the clouds or putting light at the bottom of clouds okay that means the light's not parallel it's local light it changes about one degree per 69 miles it's not the ground changing angle. It's the light. This is 100% proof of that. You can't have both. But this is their evidence. Uh, some of them suns were five degrees above the horizon. That's millions and millions of miles above your feet. And they're trying to use it as proof for underlit clouds, proof for a globe. So if we're honest, these observations end the debate. But I'm going to play with my food a little today. This is how they depict parallel sun rays on equinox. But I'm going to show you with the way the globe tilts, it could never work north and south of, of the equator. So we'll go to Google Earth. Observer 2 is at the equator, looking due east of the sunrise. Observers 1 and 3 are also looking due east. So that's not parallel. So we're going to go into Google Earth and take a deeper look at this. So one of my channel trolls put this video out to try and teach me how sunrises work on the equinox. And it says here the parallel lines are in space, not on the surface of a globe. Okay, so let's put that to the test. So look at here, it works perfect on cylinder Earth. Due east for everybody. So we're going to test that on the globe, and we're going to have a guy north of the equator, south of the equator, and one dead center at the equator. And if the sun lines up in them orientations, the globe will be just fine. So this is a picture I took over five years ago before sunrise at Jack's Beach. And... um when I first heard about flat earth, I went out to the first equinox. I pulled a string line compass east and due east. Sure enough, when the sun came up, it split the string line due east. So let's see what direction that is that I'm facing. We're going to transfer this to Google Earth and see what direction due east is. And we're going to use Google Earth because Google Earth does only great circles and partial great circles. So you know it's a straight line of sight for your particular orientation. So what straight line of sight for my particular orientation direction was I looking? So there's showing you that it's 90 degrees due east and come to find out I was looking at the equator off the coast of Africa. My straight. So here's me, I'm observer one. I'm looking in a straight line toward the equator. Okay, but I'm looking at a sun that's barely poking its head above the horizon. So I'm basically looking off into space. My line is curving down, but I'm looking straight off into space at that exact angle. Here's Observer 3. He's in the southern hemisphere. He's looking in his straight line with his respected orientation. And there's uh, Observer number 2 is at the equator. We're all looking at the same point about 6,000 miles away. Okay, listen very carefully. This is the crescendo. Okay. There are three observers, and number two is at the equator. I'm number one up at, by Jack's Beach. Okay, we are all looking due east. We are all looking along a straight line great circle. We're all looking at a sun that's barely poking its head above the horizon. So pretend we have laser beams coming out of our eyes pointing toward the sun. That laser is going to progressively get higher and higher above the ground, but it's not going to change angles. This is a trick the globe plays. They show parallel rays coming in on equinox and parallel with the equator and, and parallel with all the latitude lines, but that only works from the orientation of the equator. As soon as you move away from the equator and change orientations, the lines aren't even parallel with each other, much less the equator. This is the reason I use great circles. So if we travel in a tangent, in a straight line we're going to get higher and higher but our angle is not going to change so they can't show you parallel rays covering half the globe and bend you over backwards okay they can't your angle doesn't change so uh, from the equator we see the stars directly overhead going straight we see the stars off to the right in the distance deviating to the left 
uh, would you agree with that? The stars to the right, like deviating toward what you would call the northern hemisphere? Would but yes, if you're stood on the equator, uh, the stars passing directly overhead will be going straight overhead. If you look to the left, they'll be rotating one way. To the right, they'll be rotating the other way. You agree with that? You'll see the stars are not moving apart. It's not like gears in the so time-lapse photographs, uh, as, as you, you mentioned, often using wide-angle lens so you can see a wide part of the sky. So there is so just now they're not deviating off to the right and the left. Okay, because just a minute ago, I no, thought you said that they were. So we definitely we definitely see the stars appear to converge and diverge at the equator, right? The star trails. That's not a question in anyone's mind anymore. Do we? No, I think they stay the same angular distance from one another the whole time. So you're saying we? I'm talking about what we see. We see them appear to converge and diverge at the equator. I I don't know about star that. Do we, do we have evidence of them doing that? Oh. Right at the, at the equator, and I posted another star that's not at the equator, and it does appear that then later on in the night or whatever at some other point. It does appear that they change distances, but this is only due to perspective, as you said earlier, Zanny. Because of the wide angle lens, yeah. No, not because of wide angle lens. Even if you were, even if you took a snapshot of a single portion of the sky. It... Yet another example, people, of how a good globe proof with a little scrutiny destroys the model one hundred percent. What we're going to do here is we're going to use sticks and shadows to destroy the globe. So we know we can't measure the shadows from stars and we can't measure the sun in multiple positions at once. But with a little logic and a little observation, we see the moon follows the stars in its position. So wherever it's at in the ecliptic, it's going to follow them star trails and the sun would necessarily do the same thing. So we're going to go to sun calc and we're going to measure multiple positions at once and reference the sun. So here's 30 north, then we're going to check 30 south. We are at the equator and we have a two by two flat patch with a one meter stick in the ground to measure the shadows. So if you're not familiar with sideways sun calc, the ball that's moving represents the sun or the stars in this scenario and the stick attached to it represents the shadows that we measure. So our position is in line two, right in the middle. So we are measuring angles of stars that are moving away from each other. So this ain't optical. We can measure the shadows deviating away from each other, meaning there's more than one star trail. This can't work on a globe.